Well, a warm welcome to today's talk. It's Friday the 14th of January. Now, cases in the UK, Omicron of course, it looks like it's peaked and is on the way down. And of course the United States is uh, two or three weeks behind the United Kingdom. Does this mean that we're looking at the very end stage of the pandemic? I think it could well mean just that. But let's uh, look at some detail first of all. Now, just before we start, I wanted to talk about China. Now, China has got a no COVID or a zero COVID or a zero tolerance of COVID policy. And as a result of this, when there's a very small outbreak of COVID in a city, it shuts the whole city down uh, in a draconian way. And people are, from what we hear, suffering from this. And this is really quite bizarre because the, the Olympics is going there. The Winter Olympics is going, was it early February, I think it is? And, and it's guaranteed that it's going to flood into the country then. So the idea that you can have a zero COVID policy in the presence of Omicron, to me, just seems ludicrous. So, so what, why are the Chinese pursuing this course so resent, relentlessly and draconianly? Um, I, I really don't know. It's very strange, but that, that's their policy at the moment in China. They have this sort of zero COVID uh, policy. Anyway, I want to look at some pretty interesting information from the Office for National Statistics in the UK and, of course, from Tim Spector's uh, COVID symptom tracker app. Uh, but before we do that, let's just look at Canada. Pretty interesting. Now, China's taking one tack, zero uh, zero COVID tolerance. Canada seems to be taking completely the opposite uh, tack. Quebec stops PCR testing for the general public. Now, they've been running at about 40 to 60,000 tests per day in, in Quebec, and uh, basically they're maxed out. They, they just can't do that. The staff off sick, the testing facilities simply are not there. It is not sustainable to keep doing that. So they're just totally maxed out. And we did see the other day that Ontario had already basically stopped doing a lot of testing as well. But getting back to Quebec, PTR, uh, PCR testing is, is reserved for high-risk settings, hospital, long-term care homes, prisons, etc. Remote communities, northern communities. Do, 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 does make sense because they're just maxed out. They can't test everyone who becomes symptomatic. It's just no longer possible because of the massive tsunami of cases there as in everywhere else indeed so this is a pragmatic decision and it does make sense uh, dr maria franch reynold uh, we are absolutely overwhelmed by the omicron wave completely it's just an avalanche of it advice is to use rapid tests if available and very often these aren't available uh, and to isolate if symptomatic so <laughs> this is basically it um after two doses of vaccine, isolate for five days. And there you go. Um, so in, in uh, this is Quebec we're talking about, uh, inundated again with sickness, healthcare workers needed 12,000 off sick. Um, New Year's Day, uh, 600 or so police officers uh, off sick from the force as well. British Columbia in Canada, Zula reports British Columbia, uh, reserved for first responders, critical care. So again, they're only testing first responders, critical care staff. Uh, high prioritization groups the public are just told to isolate uh, take lateral flows if you can but there's no lateral flows either Leroy reports British Columbia we're asked not to get tested if we have if we have symptoms uh, if we've been vaccinated so basically just skip it don't bother uh, isolate and return to work uh, normal duties if you're asymptomatic at five days that's it and the UK now, of course, has gone down to five days as well. So I think we could call that a pragmatic accommodation to the virus in Canada and, and a tacit admission that it's everywhere. Exactly as we predicted, to be fair, about five weeks ago on this channel, that it was going to be everywhere. As soon as we learnt about the characteristic transmissions of Omicron, this became um, pretty obvious. Now, let's look at some of the... Uh, Tim Spector, Zoe, COVID symptom tracker uh, data, which is released weekly and is a really good indicator of how things are going. Now, Tim Spector this week has focused on incidence rather than prevalence because Omicron's moving so quickly, um, you want to look at the new cases rather than the, uh, the cases that are there. But it will also tell us in a minute that um, cases don't last for as long either, at least on average. So um, looking at this uh, COVID Zoe data now 
Uh, new cases in the UK, well, it was over 200,000 a day. Now it's down quite a bit. So there does appear... So th this is the Omicron wave here. S see how close together these... Uh, the, the, so Sorry, yeah. No, how far apart how far apart these dots are, meaning it was growing really quickly. Then much closer together, indicating a bit of plateauing, but now definitely uh, signs of reduction. Remember, this is symptomatic cases of COVID, of course, uh, because it's the COVID symptom tracker data. New cases in the UK on the 10th of, 10th of January, um, doubly vaccinated people and all people. And of course, this all people also includes the doubly vaccinated. So the difference isn't quite as stark as it looks. So again, um, dots very far apart, meaning very rapid increase in symptomatic cases in the unvaccinated, as indeed it was in the vaccinated. But now both groups definitely heading down fairly consistently. Has Omicron peaked in the UK? Uh, it looks like it has. Our case is still very high. Oh, yeah, <laughs> they're still very high, but it looks like they're on the way down. It does depend quite a lot from area to area. My area, for example, they're still scooting up. Um, regions. Um, so now this line here is actually the London line. Now, round about here, round about this time here, we saw that cases in London had taken off and we were predicting that cases in the rest of the country would follow the London trajectory. But as we can see from this graph, they haven't. So cases have been peaked out higher in London than they've peaked out in other parts of the country. This is probably due to the slightly lower vaccine uptake in London that people were infected more quickly. And uh, given that a lot of people are short of vitamin D in London as well, that could be another factor. But we did expect it to, that the rest of the country just to be lagging, but it's not. It's, it's not peaking as high. So that is quite a revealing graphic. So that's the London peak there. That peak there, for example, is where I live in the northwest. My, my particular city is going up. Most of the northwest is going down. And we can see all areas going down here. Now, this green line that's still going up is the northeast. So there is still increasing cases in the northeast. In new cases, this is. But in most of the other parts of the country, we can see that that trend is down. And of course, in London, the trend is dramatically and unmistakably down in new cases. So cases down in all parts of the country apart from the northeast, but I think we can expect that to peak and plateau fairly soon. So isn't that isn't that really quite interesting? We do seem to have peaked really quicker than I thought we would. It's pretty quick. I was expecting towards the end of January where we're here now here in the 14th of January and we're on the way down. So it's um yeah, it's pretty interesting, really. Fairly good. Well, it is very good news. Very good news. Age groups. Um, now, 18 to 35 went up first, went up dramatically. They're now going down. The green line there is the uh, 35s to 55s, the parents' generation going down. And uh, the older age groups, this that this group here is the over 75s. That red one is the uh, 55 to 75, which we're worried about in terms of hospitalisation, but also starting going down now. Now, of course, there could be some lag in hospitalisation still from these older groups. But, and, and of course, in the younger age groups, there's a certain amount of people with comorbidities. But the overall trend there is down. Now, the big proviso I would put on this is that with schools going back now, uh, children could bring the infection home to the older age groups. And that, that will happen. So the plateau might sort the drop might sort of level off for a while, but I don't think it's going to go back up as high as it was. So uh, pretty good. Now, this is this is symptoms. Now, th these are people with uh, common cold type symptoms. Now, this one here is, is non-COVID respiratory illness. And the, the blue one is COVID respiratory illness. So if we take this time here, for example, October, people who complained of respiratory illness, most of those were caused by uh, non-COVID illnesses, common cold type features, common cold viruses. And only a few were caused by um, SARS coronavirus too. But of course, as Delta, kick, as um, Omicron, sorry, as Omicron, as Delta faded out and as Omicron kicked in, in December, we see the common cold symptoms increase dramatically. So now 
where we are now, we can see that the common cold symptoms caused by Omicron and all of the coronavirus in the UK now essentially is Omicron is actually higher than those caused by uh, ordinary common cold type respiratory viruses. Therefore, if you have a common cold type symptoms now, if you have the headache, the runny nose, the sore throat, the sneezing in the UK, that is more likely to be caused by Omicron SARS coronavirus 2 than it is to be caused by a rhinovirus or one of the old fashioned, as, as we could call them, um, coronaviruses that are, have been endemic for decades. So that's, uh, yeah, pretty interesting. Now, this is not Tim Spector's data. This is Office for National Statistics data. So if we take, for example, this one here for the Northwest, this is uh, positivity. So we see positivity in the Northwest is about 10%. In other words, uh, as we know now, 10% of the tests that are being done, are, the antigen tests that are being done are coming back positive, indicating very high levels of community prevalence, which, of course, we, we already knew. And here we have the data for the other parts of the country. So Yorkshire and Humber, for example, it's what, 8.4%. London has been up, uh, now down to 7.8%. 7, 7 Sorry, you can't see that. Yorkshire and North Humber, 84 London um, down to 78 having been up. Um, East Midlands, West Midlands, all, all these are very high rates of prevalence. Northeast 7.7. Now, this was as of the, the, this data was as of the 6th of January. So this will be now higher in the northeast. Um, but there we go. E even in areas where the spread is still quite low, like the southwest, still 4.2 percent coming back positive. Five percent being the World Health Organization definition of a pandemic, of course. Um so pretty high levels. And if we look at the overall, um, this is the overall summary from the Office of National Statistics. So percentage testing positive overall, England 6.85%, pretty high. Hospital admissions are going up a bit, but do seem to have leveled off, which is pretty good news. Deaths have sort of gone up a little bit, I would think. Not massively. 61% uh, of people have had three doses of vaccine. Uh, nine out of 10 adults have antibodies. In fact, it's 97.5%. So 97.5% um, of adults in the UK have antibodies. In other words, from this data, only 2.5% of adults in the UK are SARS coronavirus 2 completely naive. And the real, the real number that have been exposed to either the vaccine antigen or the virus antigen will actually be 98% or, or higher. And that index of social distancing is around about the same. So quite interesting data. Now, let, let's move on to um, the United States. Um, daily cases are still going up in nearly all of the states. But uh, they've actually been falling in Cleveland, New York, Washington, D.C. And they may well have peaked in Chicago, New York. Uh, uh, per 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 can't say it. Percurito. <laughs> Percurito, sorry, if you live there. And a areas of uh, Colorado. Um, most areas of the states, of course, this is not true. This is just some areas. Most areas of the states, it is going up still and will continue to for another week or two. The reason some of these areas are going down more quickly, it's rather analogous to the London situation in the UK. The infection was there first and it's essentially burned through the population, leaving immunity in its wake. We certainly believe and uh, we expect that immunity to be pretty good quality immunity. Um, so Zoe's Zoe study, as we've just looked at, uh, symptomatic cases down 12% on the week. Omicron is more infectious than the common colds and influenza. So that's a microbiological point, but it does explain that graphic we saw. So Omicron is actually more infectious than common colds and more infectious than influenza. Prevalence in the UK is still high. So we're down 12% on the week, but we're still 1 in 24. London 1 in 18, North East 1 in 17 people. So there is still an awful lot of this virus about. That is uh, for sure. But we are on the way down, we believe. Omicron symptoms, incubation period short, two days. So 
So Tim Spector's data is showing that the incubation period for Omicron is much shorter than for all previous variants. It's only two days. So from when you're exposed to when you get the first sniffles, two days, 48 hours, it's really quick. Massively more transmissible and much quicker. And the symptoms, uh, the symptomatic disease with Omicron is also shorter. Now, Tim Spector used the word shorter because he didn't have precise data for how much shorter. But again, we can see the incubation period is definitely shorter. That's for sure. For sure, the uh, symptomatic period on average is shorter, but we don't know how much shorter. The precise data is not there, but, but it is true. So that, that's why Tim Spector's saying most people will probably get away with just isolating for five days. Some people will still be infectious after that, but not, not, very, not that many, a smaller percentage. COVID-19, uh, probably less than Delta, long, long COVID. Um, now, yeah, this is a good question. Tim Spector doesn't know this yet because it's going to take time, but his assumption is, <coughs> given the data he's looked at, is that there's going to be less cases of long COVID after Omicron than the significant amount of uh, long COVID we're still living with after Delta. That makes sense because there's not as much systemic inflammatory reaction going on. The infection is more combined, more, more confined to the upper airways rather than to the uh, lower airways. So less whole body inflammation, it would make sense to me that there's going to be less um, long COVID. We won't know, of course, until we've had a long time to, to find out, but we, we do believe it's looking that way. Current symptoms. Now, this is worth taking note of. Current symptoms, 73% of people who get COVID get a runny nose. 68% get a headache. 64% get fatigue. Sometimes it's bad fatigue. Sometimes it's mild fatigue or anywhere in between. Um, sneezing, 60%. Sore throat, 60%. The first on the government list, 44% to a persistent cough why the gov why the government have not updated this is just just unbelievable if you're on public transport or something it'll say the the symptoms of covid19 are, are um what does it say persistent cough uh, loss of the sense of smell and fever i think it's saying but but that's simply not <laughs> what was not what we're seeing i mean <clears throat> what why don't why don't they sort this out it really is it really is strange so um, there we go, um, sore throat 60%, persistent cough only 44%, shivers or chills 30%, fever 29%, dizziness 28%, brain fog, that horrible cluttered up cloudy brain feeling you can get 24%, altered smell and taste, um, as opposed to loss of sense of smell and taste, altered smell and taste, uh, sore eyes 23%, unusual muscle pains 23 skip meals, Loss of smell, chest pain, swollen glands, feeling down or depressed. So they're the symptoms that people are getting now, according to the uh, symptom tracker data. And this is based on pretty large numbers, of course. And you're still free to join the COVID symptom tracker study, which I would encourage you to do. Just download it on your phone. Um, now, um, Tim Spector says, uh, Zoe data suggests the Omicron wave has peaked and the cases are starting to come down in almost all regions of the UK. So we believe it has peaked. Good news. Good news. Hospitalizations, deaths and early data on the severity of Omicron is also looking positive, as we've reported from various studies. Uh, now, this is the UK, of course. We are more concerned about the United States for complicated reasons that we looked at yesterday. So if you want to know about that, watch. It's all on yesterday's uh, video. It's largely to do with comorbidities in the States. The other reassuring sign is that cases in the elderly are plateauing at a low level, sparing the more vulnerable group from the worst of the Omicron wave. Um, and as we saw, the incidence in the uh, more at risk older age groups is going down. Uh, Tim says this is because they've uh, been more careful. I'm not sure about that, actually, Tim. I think that's probably uh, that's probably more because um, they've got high levels of uh, immunity because I think um, I, I think Omicron just spreads everywhere it's um, I, I'm not telling people not to be careful of course not but it's just going everywhere that's why I changed my poster because uh, we, remember we said Omicron pre previously did said said stop COVID-19 and we can't stop it 
Omicron can't be stopped. The Indian doctors yesterday, or yesterday or the day before, the Indian physicians said that Omicron is the most infectious respiratory virus in the world. Now, I have asked them if they mean it's even more uh, infectious than um, than chickenpox, um, than measles rather, than measles, sorry, measles. Um, but um, they haven't got back to me yet. I can't imagine why not. It's not as if they're working 20 hours a day or anything like that because they're inundated with their... Uh, positive cases in india so <laughs> so i shouldn't joke about it it's a serious matter um they, they'll get back to me soon um it seems to be about as infectious as measles if it's more infectious than measles that would be simply amazing the good thing about it that the the indian doctors are seeing a lot of symptomatic patients in india but most of them aren't very sick uh, which is good so a lot of their work is actually uh um, reassurance at the moment because the patients aren't getting as sick as they did with Delta which of course we are delighted about uh, Tim Spector again however we can't rule out and oh, we mentioned that didn't we an uptick in children which could then have a knock-on effect as kids are back at school now so that's possible uh, in terms of guidance working from home remains an easy thing many of us can do to slow the spread uh, wearing high quality masks is essential so again because omicron is so infectious the lower quality masks probably just aren't doing the job anymore covid symptoms are now for the first time this winter more common than the common cold and flu and are indistinguishable indistinguishable you can't tell the difference there you go so most most is now presenting as uh, these cold symptoms I don't expect these rates to go down to zero as Omicron is so infectious that it will probably continue to circulate at manageable levels in the population until late spring, is uh, Tim Spector's estimate. OK, um, that was from the um, Office for National Statistics. Uh, j just a quick uh, note from Elias here. Uh, got, alpha, got alpha in April, was ill for two weeks back in April. Just got Omicron last week. Uh, was very mild for me this time around first 24 hours felt like a cold had the chills overnight with a slight cough 72 hours later all is pretty much normal now so excellent this is fairly typical not universal but fairly typical uh, and not vaccinated uh, but now we'll have a, a good level of immunity after being exposed to uh, omicron we would think uh I believe prior infection probably made it mild for me this time. So yeah, that's for true. So you've essentially had two antigenic doses. You've had you've had the alpha in April. You've had the uh, omicron in uh, omicron in January. And yes, the reason that you got mild omicron was probably because you did have the alpha in April. You would still have good levels of T cell immunity after that time now we've got a lot of other personal experiences to look at but i want to go to jordan who's uh giving us a special report from utah so over to you jordan and thank you uh very much hi dr campbell and everyone um my name is jordan i'm in utah in the united states i have cerebral palsy so if i'm hard to understand that's why um, a governor just did a press conference about, that uh, just ended five minutes ago, about the state of COVID in Utah, and I thought I would share it with you. He, um, they've suspended test to stay, which was a program they were using to stop the spread in schools because of the, um, the amount of positivity they were having was so high that it was basically showing no effect in reducing the spread. So they suspended that and they're allowing schools with high cases to do a four day virtual week. Um, they've also said please stop testing if you have symptoms. Um, assume you have COVID and unless you're high risk or work with the high risk, just assume you have COVID and isolate for five days and then wear a mask in public for the next five days. Um,
So that's gonna skew our numbers here in Utah. So yeah, if you see a rapid drop off in the U.S., we are having major issues with supply chain of tests, which at 24 months into the pandemic seems ridiculous in my opinion. But that's where we're at in Utah. Um, yeah, so no more COVID testing if you're symptomatic unless you're high risk or you work with the high risk. Um, they also requested that events be delayed because the Department of Health in Utah does not have the capacity to do mass testing at the moment, so, yeah. The good thing is they are acknowledging in Utah that Omicron is significantly less severe, and they're saying to wear an N95 or KN95 because cloth masks, in the opinion of the state of Utah, do nothing. So, sorry this is scatterbrained and not organized nicely, but I thought I'd record it and send it to you while I had a minute right after the press conference. Thanks, and thank you for all your non-biased coverage of the pandemic. It's really great for science-oriented people like this engineering student. Hi, Dr. Campbell and everyone. Um, Thank you I very much for that, Jordan. Jordan. Let I me just uh, turn that off. Am I back on? I'm back on and Jordan is off. Yes. Okay, thanks for that, Jordan. V very enlightening. Um, and this is the problem that we've... So rather similar to the problem in Canada. So assume symptoms are COVID and it's mo it's uh, if it's the same as the COVID symptom tracker data there's over a 50% chance that it is five days isolation followed by five days mask wearing and, and, and as you rightly say the the the, uh, the sort of simple cloth masks basically aren't going to cut it with Omicron because it is so transmissible um, but it's gone around everywhere so um, yeah it's what we expected we expected to go around everywhere and it has uh, but it's because because it's gone around so quickly. Um, it's also peaked quickly and it's going down quickly. So the whole thing is like compressed, isn't it? So the, the signs and symptoms for the individual is compressed. Short incubation period, normally a short time actually suffering from the disease. Uh, but the whole waves have been compressed, even though they've been the highest that we've seen so far. Uh, but I believe if we did uh, a graph of the uh, development of immunity in the population, it would also be doing that. Question is, how long is it going? How long is it going to stay up for? Hopefully, quite some time. Okay, that is us. Um, we are looking, I believe, at the end stage of the pandemic now. And uh, thank you for watching.